Lord, I could sing these songs. Uh, I know the truth. I know the truth, Lord. I know that your scriptures are the truth. I know you came to fulfill the truth. And uh, I know there is no one like you. Nobody. Yep. And I could trust you. Even if I don't trust you at times in my life, you're still there. It's amazing. Don't let me go. Don't let any of us go when you live in us. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your name. You said, you may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. And I just pray in the name of Jesus for everybody here today. I'm praying for myself too, Lord. But everyone, Zoom, whatever, that those words, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Make them real. Make them real, God. I know the verse, but make it real, Holy Spirit. John's right. There's no way any of us can go through this unless Jesus does it through us. Well, I offer my weakness as I'm going to end this message, but I offer it in the beginning. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that I see in men that is pleasing. Only in you, Master. Only in you. You are the most excellent of men. God has blessed you forever and anointed your lips with grace. Please help us. Help us. I don't even know what I want help for anymore. I just know I need your help. I need your help, Lord. Thank you so much. You're our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. This is an interesting passage. Like, I've been really struggling. I got this sermon, and then on the fifth, and that's my last sermon in this church. And it's 20 years in this church. 25 years of pastor. My last sermon, and then I'll be probably really full kilt as an evangelist which I will be only thinking about Jesus Christ and him crucified. But no distraction. Only him. And, uh, yeah, so it's funny that you all hadn't said about discipline because I think that's where I'm going somewhere in my last sermon. Discipline. So... So anyways, this uh, message is John chapter 13, verses 18 to 38, if you're following me. And uh, it's about, well, let me just begin. Hypocrisy. Think what it will be. Now, this is between you and the Lord, me and the Lord. And that one day we will be standing in front of him. He loves us deeply, but we will be evaluated no matter what. Everything under the blood will not come up. Anything that's not under the blood will come up. Think of what it will be to have it proven that you were godly for the sake of gain. Now I'm talking about the heart and the secret place of your life mind to that you were generous out of showing off or zealous for loving for the love of praise that you were careful in public to maintain a religious reputation but that all the while everything was done for self and self only at the end when all has been said and done i want to talk about this message because it's probably so serious and what is the difference between betraying Christ and denying him? Betraying Jesus Christ and denying him. What is the difference? Betraying him and denying him. Let me read 
John chapter 13, verses 18 to 30. Follow me if you will. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. I just want to stop. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, he does love us deeply, but he loves the scriptures more. He loves the will of God more than anything else on earth or in heaven. And he chose Judas Iscariot to fulfill the scriptures. That is a heavy verse. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, and here is suffering, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Now, you've got to get that. You don't miss that. The stuff here, man. Don't miss it. Here are 12 of them looking around saying, who is it? So this Judas Iscariot did it so well, they didn't catch on. Only Jesus knew. But all the rest of them didn't know who it was that was going to betray him because he hid himself so well. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. G Simon Peter motioned to his disciple and said, ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in, di in the dish. Th then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. And this is heavy, this verse. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do it quickly. You're seeing Jesus Christ hand somebody over. Right in the Bible. What you are about to do, do it quickly. Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. So Judas had it. So Judas had charge of the money. Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast. They had no clue. No clue. This guy hid well. No clue. Or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. That's not a fluke. That's there. And it was night. Judas betrayed our Lord Jesus Christ. <sighs> what a legacy to have where Christ said it would be better if you have never been born because you're going into hell. Better that you never were born. And that's really something for the lost. When you do not receive Jesus, it's better that you've never been born when you die. It's not been said too much in the church because everybody wants to win people. God wants the truth. He wants people to know the truth. Because if you know the truth, the truth what? Sets you free. <laughs> Even no matter how hard it is. I remember seeing this picture and Don showed it to me. It goes, you'll know the truth. And then he has a guillotine with a doll. <laughs> and the guillotine's on the doll. And at the bottom of it says, and it will set you free. But first it makes you miserable. It's true. When you see things like this, you wonder, wow, God is not fooling around with justice, with wrath, with giving people up. And yet he's merciful and he's loving and he's kind, but he's everything. And we do not set this apart. We put everything together of who he is, this Jesus. That's why I'm really, really wondering at the end of my ministry, what I think I'm going to focus on more than anything else is the wrath of God. 
And the reason is, is because I believe that without the wrath of God, the gospel is devoid of power. And I think that the prophets were right when they were saying about God's wrath, God's wrath. How, where does it come in with the gospel? Here it is. This is where it comes in. You reject Christ and you will have the wrath of God. That needs to be said to the lost. You reject Christ and you will feel the wrath of God. That's why Jesus, it was like he sweat drops of blood because he was heading for that cup of wrath for you and me. Only he takes it or somebody takes it, but God's justice stays in place. That needs to be said. This is a real, real uh, crystal clear view of what God thinks of justice. Crystal clear. And nobody's going to get away. Nobody. That's why before I die, I hope I, he gives me enough time to say, if there's anything between me and you, Lord, let me put it under the blood so it won't come up. We don't want to play around with that. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Only the blood of Christ can really spare you. Not how good you are. God is not looking for good people. <laughs> He's looking for real people be real that's my word to you when i leave this church i've tried to do this for 20 years be transparent be real you're gonna have to be someday one day you know it's funny in verse john 13 verse 2 judas betrayed christ what an awful place to be in what an awful way to have your uh to be in all through the bible Listen to this one, John 13, 2. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. The word prompt means to urge to action, to urge into action. And this is what happens when you are being tempted by the devil or I'm being tempted. He is putting thoughts into your mind to do something that's against what God wants. And it's the same word, I believe, it's an enticement. And it's putting, an enticement really means, it means you put bait for an animal to be trapped. And that's what the devil does. He puts bait where you are. And he knows exactly everyone's weakness, this devil. That's why you have to either... Hide your weakness, and I'm going to say this in the, in, at the end of my sermon. You either hide your weakness or you I bring it out and give it to the Lord so he can protect you in your weakness. Because if you don't, you will be taken down. Because he knows. He really does. So here we have it. Verse 27. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do Quickly, Jesus told them. <laughs> In Romans chapter 1, you read this. And God gave them over. And God gave them over. Three times, God gave them over. God has a lot of mercy. I, I believe he had a lot of mercy on this man. Washing his feet. Let him, let him take control of the money. Like you as a treasurer. He let Judas Iscariot take control of all the money. Imagine the trust. And, and let me tell you another thing, too. I need to say this. I really do. If you go to Psalm 41.9 with me, this is what he quotes. You got to see that Christ was a man. So this hurt him. This hurt him. And I have a feeling it hurt him bad. This betrayal. But look at this. Psalm 41.9. He doesn't quote this passage, just the ending of it. I want to do the whole thing so you see what Jesus is going through. Psalm 41.9, even my close friend, whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Even my close friend, whom I trusted. So it wasn't that he was trying to, you know, uh, trap Judas. 
He was actually trying to win him and woo him. It was his friend. He considered Judas Iscariot a close friend of one of the 12. And he trusted him with the money. So this makes the betrayal even more deep and painful when you see things like that. And here, here you have it. And I was going to quote this too. First Peter chapter 5, verses, I believe it's 8 and 9. And he goes like this, be self-controlled. And this is the way all of us should be. I'm not like that all the time, but may God help me and you guys. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Re this is how we do it. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Everybody's going through this. And Judas Iscariot had went through it and failed, but man, failed drastically. And let me tell you another thing too. This is a perfect thing. You do not just, this is what I want to really make a difference is. This denial and betrayal, you're going to see, it took me a while to try and figure it out. I thought it was the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. Because what he did, he intentionally did it. Intentionally is the word. Intentionally. He planned it. Because because he was the money, uh, the guy who took care of the money, he had a problem. Because if you see in John chapter 12, verse 6, you check it out, he had a problem already. So he already was being set up. John chapter 12, verse 6. Look at this. He did not say this because he cared about the poor. But because he was a thief, as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So already he set up. He put himself into this place. And, you know, I'm telling you, the devil does this. He sets us up. If you just don't fall. This guy just didn't fall. It was being set up. And he walked in, 30 pieces of silver, mm, maybe I can make a quick buck. Little did he know what was going to come down. <laughs> Here, let me read this to you. This is devastating for this man. 27, Matthew 27, 1 to 6. I want to read it, 1 to 5, sorry. It goes, early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to the to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas had betrayed him, saw his, his plan didn't work, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Hanged himself. And here, why did, Jesus, why did Judas hang himself? Hey, why did he hang himself? Because the word remorse. He had remorse. He had remorse. And I want to use another word too. He had regret. He had regret. And you know what? There's a real key here that you've got to see. When he said, I have sinned, who did he sin against? See, general confession means nothing. Specific confession comes from the Holy Spirit. I've sinned. I've sinned. And notice I, the I, I've sinned. Worldly sorrow is concerned with the I and the me and not God. And there's another guy too that did this. I, and you guys know him, Saul. Let me read. Let me read this too. Samuel comes to Saul, confronts Saul, convicts him, 
And then all of a sudden, he's convinced. He knows he did wrong. You should see how this man tried to defend himself too. And that's one sign that you're not, you don't, you don't feel anything. You don't care. You defend yourself. Then Saul, 1 Samuel 15, 24, and 25. I want to point out something too when I finish. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Eh, I've sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the people, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. And look at how many times the eye is. Look at how many times. One eye, two eyes, three eyes, four eyes, five eyes, six eyes. I, 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 I. Just about me. Just about me. Saul and Judas have sinned, yeah. But against who? This is what they call general confession, which means nothing biblically. Nothing means nothing. Specific confession, the Holy Spirit really, truthfully, after 25 years of ministry and watching this stuff, I really believe now that true confession, when it's from the Spirit of God convicting a man, he does not do general confession. He says exactly what God says. This is where you're wrong. It's not, I've sinned. I've sinned against such and such. I've sinned. I've done this wrong. Like children, what'd you do wrong? Oh, you know, I did something wrong. What? And it needs to be specific to make it biblical confession. And I, I really believe this too, direct uh, confession. When it's from God and you do it from your heart and you don't do it to impress people, but you do it because you've sinned against almighty God. That's who we really sin against. When we do something wrong, it's not to my wife or my kids and it's not to anybody in this place. When I do something wrong, it's against him and him only. Against you, David said, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We need to get that deep in our heart. Then it really affects us and changes us. Nothing else changes us like that. Confession has a direct, direct thing of being filled with the spirit when it's done that way. You know, when you think about it, this worldly sorrow, <laughs> That you, that, you know what it really is, eh? That people get caught before they openly come forward. They get caught. And then, I'm so sorry. You, you, if you've done anything wrong or I've done anything wrong, you don't want to get caught. Huh, I definitely don't want to get caught with my wife. Because she's going to say, you, you, you're getting, because I caught you. But you should have came before you were caught. Because this being caught this way is worldly sorrow. And another worldly sorrow, and I've sinned in these areas. So God has forgiven me, and I know that. But another one is, when you say sorry to somebody only to make false peace, that's worldly sorrow. It shouldn't be done that way. And I've learned, I have to say something to my wife, and I was going to do it today. Confession. We get into all kinds of stuff. But you know what I heard God say to me? Don't say anything to her about sorry, because she's going to think you're doing it so you can preach. Our wives know us really good, and some won't say anything. My, I think our wives are the ones that need to say something to us. They're our protection. So I will say sorry, but after I'm finished preaching, so she knows I didn't do it to preach. Are you hearing me? I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Where is John? I'm getting it. I want to get away from worldly sorrow. 
and I want to have godly sorrow. I'm getting it. And temptation is powerful, isn't it? Wouldn't you say temptation is powerful? It's powerful. When you're by yourself, man, it's powerful. Oh, it's so powerful. And if you don't think so, then you're not living on planet Earth. And you do not know how powerful the devil is. It is powerful. That's why only, yet not I, but through Christ in me, he is the only one who can do that and defeat him through us. You try it alone, and you're coming down. Just try it alone. And I have done it, and I've come down. Listen to this unknown quote. The power of temptation is the deceptive offer of immediate pleasure without consequences. Repeat it. The power of deception of temptation is the deceptive offer of immediate pleasure without consequences. That's why sexual lust is so powerful. Because it has that immediate pleasure. And then after, it can destroy your marriage. That's why I don't judge anybody who falls in this area. Just pray for them. We just pray for them. John Piper, he says this one time, he saw a man crying, he got caught, and he's crying in the courtroom because the judge sentenced him to, I think, eight years in jail. And the guy started crying and weeping, and John goes, he's not crying because he's sorry. He broke the law. He's crying because his freedom is being taken away. That's true. That's worldly sorrow. Second Corinthians 7.10. This is all Judas Iscariot, a picture of Judas Iscariot. Worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow, Peter, the apostle. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. And Saul and Judas Iscariot hung themselves. And you know it was worldly sorrow. Dead. When you and I, when our way consumes us, I don't care what it is. Listen to me very carefully. Yesterday I was with a missionary. Nobody needs to know. I'm with these type of people. I'm sitting across the table to him, and this person wants to go to the Muslim world. Praise the Lord. God spoke to me. He really spoke to me. And I know this man knows that he did. I'm sitting there. And this verse comes to me. And I said, this is what I said. Remember when Jacob was wrestling with that man? They say it's Christ, the theophany of Christ. He's wrestling. And then this, he, Jacob says, and everybody knows it, I will not let go. Say it. I will not let go. Right. But he says, I will not let go of you. And I said to him, are you holding on to your mission rather than Jesus? And he just stunned him because he was talking so much about his mission, hardly a little bit about Jesus. And truthfully, I don't care what it is. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do. You and I, if we follow Jesus in four weeks, I will no longer be a pastor. I'll be like an evangelist running around, sharing my faith, bringing people to Christ. My whole identity is going to change. But I told this man, and I tell you this, I am so happy that I will have no distractions. Only one thing I'm going to do, I will not let go of you, Christ, until you bless me with yourself. I want to know what it means to be filled to the fullness of Jesus Christ. I'm going after it like I've never went after it after we finish. And you should do this too. This should be your, don't go after anything else but that. And then what God will do and bless you what you really want. Because if you delay yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. But if you reverse it, you will 
be in misery. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. Nothing else. And everything else, if you go after him, you get everything. That's why I think it's in there. I will not let go of you. I will not let go of you. I, let go of everything else, but don't let go of Jesus Christ. Let go of all your ministry. Let go of everything that you have, but not Jesus Christ. And when you have Jesus Christ and when Jesus is leading you, he will lead you into the purposes he wants. And that's where I'm going. And he's going to lead this church into the purposes he wants. That's why my heart for this church is not for, you're right, no man. I made a mistake like I'm following other men. They fell like nine pins. Only Christ didn't fall. Only Jesus is at the right hand of God. Only Christ can help us. And when we only get to that, that's why he took away your job. So he can tell you, hey, oh, you need me. You need me. And you know, something is coming heavy to our earth. You can bet on it, man. When we start trusting in men and not him, something's coming. Something is coming. I don't know what it is. I just pray, God, make me strong enough in the grace of God to hold on. Hold on. Help me. See, when my way, whatever it may be, and I've had done this. I remember this lady, Jenny Leslie. She's 89. She's blind. She sends me things who her cousin uh, dictates, and she sends in their, their messages. You got to read them. I'll give them to you. I will. I'll give them to you. They're powerful, man. She's blind. She's got joy, and I'm going, what the... What do you have joy for? You're blind. You can't, you're 89. You've got aches all over. And she's got so much joy, it's, it's sickening. And it's the Holy Spirit. It, they're not down or anything. This lady is convicting me. And she told me one time, and I, now it's coming back to me in the next four weeks. I know I'm moving into this. She said, I remember 25 years ago, she challenged me. And she said to me, do you want to preach more than you want Jesus? And I said, lay your gift down of preaching at his feet and let God let you pick it up. Because when you do, it will be the rod of almighty God. And I did 25 years ago. I wasn't even in ministry. And God opened so many doors for me. It was unbelievable. I've never been without money when I did that. Never. Never been without anything, as a matter of fact. It's been an incredible journey. But now I have to do it again, and so do you. You have to lay everything down at the feet. This church, lay it down. It's your church, Lord. Take over. Let her fly. Do it. But when we're consumed to the point that, that what we have in our hand is more important than what God wants to give us, we, we step into a foothold of the devil. Because the devil can give you anything you want except Jesus. He can give it to you. Because he did it to Christ, didn't he? Fall down. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. Hey, it must have been true. He could have done that. Because Jesus didn't say you can't do it. He just said, you worship him and him only. That's it. And that's the bottom line of it all. Anything that consumes you rather than, even being right. Even being right can consume you and devil get a foothold in your life. Happened to me. May God help me, man, to grow up. Amy Carmichael said, beware what you set your heart upon, for it shall surely be yours. If it's Christ, it will be yours. Anything else, watch out. When Christ can no longer get your attention because you have set your heart on whatever, you're going to hear these words. What you're about to do, do it quickly.
We need to really fear God, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by your own flesh. We need to know who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with a mamsy pamsy Jesus. We're dealing with the Lord of heaven and earth. We're dealing with the one who will stand in front. All of us, we really need to come down to it. Imagine, you just gotta imagine he was one of the 12. What an awesome opportunity. And he goes out and he hangs himself and betrays Christ. You know, and here's where it gets it. And Peter denies Christ. Eh? And I always thought, you know, what's the difference between betrayal and denial? I thought it was the same to me. So I started studying this thing. He denies Christ, he breaks down, and he weeps and was restored by Jesus. You wonder why? In John chapter 13, 36 and 38, I want to read it. He goes, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Have you ever done things like that with God? I'll do this, Lord. I'll do it, and I don't do it. I'll lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Mark chapter 14, verse 7 says this, immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you'll disown me three times. And he broke down and he wept. Godly soul broke down and wept. I often wonder, you know, just think, I just think of this, 40 years of my life, past that, what a, what a mess. But the 40 years, faithful to the Lord. Truthfully, and she knows it. I think I've made two mistakes yeah, two mistakes on the internet in the 40 years, and I told her, and she forgave me. I said, I just, and you know, I'm, I'm not illiterate in the internet, so I, I made a mistake, and I'm not going to, and I, I went before the Lord, and he said, don't do this again. This is a slippery slope. Stay away from this. But never with my wife and I. Me and my wife, I don't even know what I would do if I ever did this place to trust. I couldn't stand up and say everything is okay. I'd be so broken, it wouldn't be funny. Because I know I would wreck my wife and my two kids and the church. And I just want you to know that I really believe godly sorrow comes with real brokenness. And when you don't see it, I don't care if somebody sins greatly in that area and they don't, we don't see it, there's something very wrong. Something's very, very wrong. Because there should be some sort of brokenness. The Lord is close to what? The broken heart. And saves those who are crushed in spirit. This is my only hope if I ever fell into that. That I would fall upon the mercy of almighty God. And he'd be close to me. Because I made a mistake. Out of weakness. We are capable of doing any sin out of our weakness. And if you think you can't. Then you have a pride problem. Not a weakness problem. You can do any sin. Put in the right position, the right circumstance, nobody around, you are capable. Because you have a sin nature that's like a wild animal inside of you. And only the Spirit's power, Christ in you, the hope of glory, can really put that to death. It's the only way. There's no other way. And that's why godly sorrow brings repentance because when you're broken before the Lord, he grants you the repentance to turn back to him. And he's done it to me. 
and he's done it to you too. It's funny how Peter got into the situation, eh? I'll never. I'll lay down my life for you, Lord. You know, I wanted to share with you. I'm no better than Peter. You know, I think me and Peter are going to have a good laugh when I meet him in heaven. I think a lot of you people are going to have a good laugh. We're all like Peter, all of us. Listen to this verse. I was thinking of it. It's James chapter 5, 4. This is why I really think for uh, Peter. Listen to this. You got to hear this one. James chapter 4, it says this. No, James chapter 3, verse 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Great boast. That was a great boast. Eh? I will lay down my life for you. And I'm wondering how many boasts, how many times I do that. How many times have I done it? I pray that God would correct my life in this area. That when you say your yes be, yes, your no be, no, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Very, very important. Very important. So here it is. Out of Peter's weakness, he denies Christ. What's the difference here? I want to get it. There is a difference between betrayal of Christ and denying Christ. Here it is. Betrayal. Listen to me. It took me a little while. It's only one sentence, but it took me a while to try and get this. Betrayal is out of rebellion and intentional sin, planning it. Denial is out of weakness, and it is unintentional. And, Spur and this is why I believe it's so important when Spurgeon goes, the mark of a true saint is that his sorrows remind him of his sins, and his sorrow for sin drives him to his God, God for forgiveness. <laughs> Will you just give me... Uh, just give me a little bit of time, okay? I was trying to make this thing. I, it was two years ago that I said this one verse to everybody at the general meeting. And it was Hosea 10, 12. And it was like this. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. I said that. Now, give me a little bit of time. Just bear with me, okay? I want to read this thing to you. A.W. Tozer, miracles follow the plow. So in your church, in our church, what's happening right now, something's happening, okay? But something's happening all over. Truthfully, everything is just out of whack right now. Listen to this. Here are two kinds of ground. Fallow ground and ground that has been broken up by the plow. The fallow field that's not been broken up, it's just is smug, contented, protected from the shock of the plow and the agitation of the herald. Such a field as it lies year after year becomes familiar landmark to the crow and the blue jay. Had it, had it intelligence, it might take a lot of satisfaction in its reputation. It has stability, nature has adopted it, it can be counted upon to remain always the same while the fields around it change from brown to green and back to brown again. Safe and undisturbed, it sprawls lazily in the sunshine, the picture of a sleepy contentment, but it is paying a terrible price for its tranquility. Never does it see the miracle of growth, Never does it feel the motions of a mounting life, nor see the wonders of bursting seed, nor the beauty of ripening grain. Fruit it can never know because it is afraid of the plow and the hare. What an awful state to be in, Judas Iscariot. In direct, oppos in direct opposite to this, this is the broken up, plowed up ground. The cultivated field has yielded itself to the adventure of living. The protecting fence has opened to admit the plow, and the plow has come as plows always come, practical, cruel, businesslike, and in a hurry. Peace has been shattered by the shouting farmer and the rattle of machinery. The field has left the travail of change. It has been upset, 
turned over, bruised and broken, but its rewards come hard upon its labors. The seed shoots up into the daylight, its miracle of life, curious, exploring the new world above it. All over the field, the hand of God is at work in the age old and ever renewed service of creation. New things are born to grow, mature, and consummate the grand prophecy latent in the seed when it entered the ground. Nature's wonders follow the plow. Miracles follow the plow. There are two kinds of lives. Also, the fallow and the plow. For examples of the fallow life, we need not go far. There are all too plentiful among us. The man of fallow life is contented with himself and the fruit he once bore. He does not want to be disturbed. He smiles tolerantly, superiority at revivals, fasting, self-searchings, and all the travail of fruit bearing and the anguish of advance. The spirit of adventure is dead within him. He is steady, faithful, always his accustomed place like the old field, conservative and something of a landmark in the little church. But he is fruitless. The curse of such a life is that it is fixed both in size and in content. To be has taken the place of to become. The worst can be said of such a man is that he is what he will be. He has fenced himself in and by the same act, he has fenced out oh God and the miracle. The plowed life is the life that has, in the act of repentance, thrown down the protecting fences and sent the plow of confession into the soul. The urge of the spirit, the pressure of circumstances, and the distress of fruitless living have combined thoroughly to humble the heart and bring it into brokenness. Such a life has put away defense and has forsaken the safety of death for the peril of life. Discontent, yearning, contrition, courageous obedience to the will of God, these have bruised and broken the soil till it is ready again for the seed of his word. As always, fruit follows the plow. As always, miracles follow the plow. Life and growth begin as God rains down righteousness. Such a one can testify, and the hand of the Lord was upon me there. I'll tell you something. God, when you're a Christian, as you would say in the Hebrews 12, you will have no choice if you're a believer to go through this. He will make you go through this. If you're his son and daughter, there's no, no way around. And there's no, as you said it, I'm glad you said it, no comparing yourself with one another. Now it'll be between you and your God. And he will break you. So he can make you into his son. And that's why Peter, out of his weakness, God restored him. He was broken, man. And I want you to know that for all of us here, out of our weakness, don't hide from it. Embrace it. Offer it. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge your weakness. Like the Apostle Paul, what does he say? Therefore, I'll boast all the more, not boast in any of our achievements, but I'll boast in my weaknesses. So that what? Christ's power may rest upon me. And this is what we need. We need Christ's power. And you know, there is another verse I was going to use. And the best way to explain it is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. This verse has been a lifeline for me. Because I, I've, I failed God quite a bit, just like the rest of you guys. But this is a lifeline that he holds on to me. I don't hold on to him. And in my weakness, when I give him my weakness, he uses it for his strength. Listen to this. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Here's a trustworthy saying. I want to end my message with this. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. Listen to this. This is Judas Iscariot. If we disown him, he will also disown us. That's Judas Iscariot. But here's Peter. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. And that's the way it is. If you are faithless, like me, 
and you belong to Jesus Christ, he will not disown himself because you belong to him. So this message is like, if you're born again and you have the spirit of God in you, you can rest in the faithfulness of almighty God because he won't let go of you. But if you're not born again and you're playing the part, then it's time to get in and see Jesus and invite him into your heart because it's the only safe place you have as we're moving to the end of the age. Pray with me, please. <laughs> Father, thank you for saving me. But I can't say this for anybody in this room, not even for my wife or children. I can only say it for myself because it's a personal relationship with you. But I do want to thank you that I'm safe in the hands of Almighty God. And anybody else who has put their trust in the Lord will never be put to shame. We are safe in the hands of Almighty God. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we have. In Jesus' name, amen.